Thank you for tuning into Aversa University. Uh, this is Sam. You guys probably won't be hearing from me too much. I'm the producer, so I'll be editing and um, doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. But we're here with our two hosts, Garrett Metcalf, Sean Giles. Um, I know they've been hanging out during quarantine, doing some pretty interesting things. They're going to talk about our upcoming episode today and kind of how we, how and why we kickstarted this uh, podcast. So. Yeah, I'll throw it over to Sean. What's going on, buddy? Hey, Sam. Uh, just trying to make the most out of this quarantine. We had this great idea. It was a collaboration. I think Gary likes to take a little bit of the credit for it. He was kind of the, the mastermind. Um, but we really just want to show you guys that everyone has to go through tough times in their lives. And hopefully from listening to this, it will not only inspire you to keep pursuing your dreams, but it will also give you some tips and tricks too that other people have used to overcome their obstacles. Uh, specifically today, Derek Parra, uh, today's part two of his interview. If you haven't listened to part one, make sure you go back because we've had a lot of great feedback and I'm sure that you guys are gonna love this part just as much. We wanted to split this one into two parts because it ran a little long. It was over an hour, the actual interview itself. And right now we think a good spot for us is around 35, 45 minutes per episode. So. If you guys want to hear longer episodes and you want us to get more in depth with these guests, just let us know. You can reach us at any of our social media accounts. Just search Adversity University on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, Garrett, what did you think about Derek? And what are some things you're maybe looking forward to hearing from the second part? Yeah, so I grew up with Derek, so I had kind of a special relationship with him. And uh, I got to know him a little bit better when I was younger. Um, you know, on a, on a more personal level, but his story is just unbelievable. And as Sean mentioned before, I think the best part about all these stories is it doesn't matter what sport that, or background these people come from. You'll be hearing from a, a Marine um, here shortly or a Navy SEAL. But just the fact that, like Sean mentioned, that no matter what profession that you're in, you're always going to face peaks and valleys. And I think it's important to note that no matter what tough times these people face, they always found a way to to battle through that adversity and battle through that tough situation, just to continue to keep climbing. And they never let anything get in their way. And I think that's such a powerful thing. Cause I really think that if you want to do something, you'll sacrifice anything to make that happen. And that's one of the biggest inspirations that came from Derek's story is he found zero excuses on trying to get his path to being an Olympic gold medalist. And he finally did that. I think you guys will really enjoy the episode. Um, if you guys in the future have any questions for the guests that'll be coming on the show, don't be afraid to comment on our social media page. Uh, you can DM us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And if you also have other guests that you guys feel have a, an inspiring story that you'd like us to interview, definitely shoot uh, their contact our way and we'll reach out to them. For all you listeners out there that don't know where Garrett and I began our hockey journey, it was with the Colorado Rampage where a list of other notable alumni also began their career as young student athletes. The Colorado Rampage AAA hockey program is currently accepting registrations for their tryouts and identification camps to find elite players and people looking to play AAA hockey and take their career to the next level. The Rampage play in the Tier 1 Elite League, which is one of the best AAA leagues in the country. This is where your players will get to showcase their skill in front of scouts for the best junior teams, colleges, and even professional teams in North America. We would encourage anyone between the ages of 12 and 18 who are looking for a place to develop and start their hockey career the same way we did to send an email to play AAA at coloradorampage.org to get more information. That's P-L-A-Y-A-A-A at C-O-R-A-M-P-A-G-E dot org. You can also visit their website at www.corampage.com. Be better today than you were yesterday and join the herd. Let's kick it over to Derek Parra, part two. Yeah, you mentioned Alex Cavallini, the goalie for USA Women's Ice Hockey. We talked about this with, with her, but being an Olympic athlete is so extraordinary and there are so few opportunities to compete. An athlete's prime is very limited. Like you talked about roller hockey, 26 is already too old. So each missed opportunity leads to another four-year wait. How did you use the heartbreaking news of 0 0.012 seconds short to motivate you for the future Olympics? And were there challenging decisions that followed with even continuing to chase this dream at all? 
Uh, you know, I, I again, I think these these things are blessed. I try to look at a positive uh, piece of all of this whenever something like this happens to me because at that point I was rock bottom. There's nowhere to go but up. And I remember coming home going, okay, the games are in four years. Um, can I do this? And then I, I got the job with the Home Depot. So that was definitely a step in the right direction. I finally had some money coming in consistently so I could do this. Uh, but right away we lost our coach. And I wasn't having the greatest success with the, the current coach. He was a Dutch guy. They trained a certain way. And my, quite frankly, my volume and intensity on inlines training was much harder. Volume's harder than what they were doing on the ice. And um, I, I would argue about it with him for a number of months going into the games because he was a very gifted skater. Um, the Dutch, they grew up skating, right? They're, they grew up on canals. They, they, their training program in the summer is basically getting in shape. They run. They don't even skate. They do some running, some jumping, a little bit of plyos, but most try to get as, as aerobically fit as possible. So they start skating. They can hold that aerobic level and the capacity as long as they can throughout the season. Where I was learning to skate, I needed to be down in that position more and more. And this is the same when I came into roller skating at, a, at an older age of 14, which is old. Um, but my coach, after that Olympic Games, when we lost our coach, I called my old roller skating coach, Roto Dooley. And I said, uh, hey, I'm going to go four more years. What do you think? And he goes, you know what? I think you need to change your, change your training. You need to go back to what you did when you were inline skating. Because I was number one in the world. And I knew my body and what, what made my body fit and strong and powerful. And um, so dynamic. So I talked with him and we got, went through some old training programs and I go, okay, so for six months, we didn't have a coach. And I made my own training program for the, that was six months. And I got into the best shape of my life. Uh, super fit, super strong, very powerful. I was jumping around with a weight, 40 pound weight vest in a park all summer long in Milwaukee, uh, imitating these speed skating uh, positions and exercises all on, on shoes. And I got so strong in that position. Our, we got a new coach and he wanted to put me back in the weight room. And I said, no, no, I, I can't. I, I'm on this great path right now. And I had to work with him and I had to basically prove to him if, if I could do this the whole year and, and increase my ranking, he'd let me do more. So that first year I, I got about probably 30% of the training program I could do on my own or with, with my own uh, direction. And then I went from 33rd to 19th to 20th. So he gave me some more workouts. Then I had about 50 to 60% of my workout program regimen that I could write. And the rest was his. And then I got better again. And then we started working together with this new coach and we found our niche of how to communicate and what worked good for me, what good for what, what he could be satisfied with and help me be a better ice skater. And then all of a sudden our team started seeing my progression. They want to do what I was doing. And then our team came together and we had this incredible training program. That was great. I was very tough. Um, and it, every year we all got better. So what drove me was I felt that I had the ability to be, to be good, to be successful. The, the limiting factor was that window was slowly closing on me because I was, you know, at this point, I'm 31 years old the summer of the, the Olympic Games in 2002. That's really old for a, for a skater. But I really believed that I could do something, and I had a great training program. I had some great teammates around me. Um, and then I was inspired by everything that happened in, the, um, you know, in those months leading up to it. So uh, it was a very magical uh, two weeks there for me. But uh, there was a lot of you know, peaks and valleys getting there, and, and the focus for me was really just, I, again, I knew I could – I knew I had the ability to, it just was having an opportunity, getting myself the opportunity to, to prove that. Changing your, as you said, changing your, you know, workout routine and slowly gaining more percentage over what you could do. Um, this was all in preparation for the 2002 Olympics, which you were clearly working for because you had, you know, been so disappointed in the Olympics before. While you were also working at Home Depot for hours a day, <laughs> what was it like working a job on top of your rigorous training schedule? Brutal. Um, you know, but, and, and if you ask our athletes today, a lot of the athletes today, uh, it's, it's never going to be a level playing field. I should say that first. If you look at an American athlete compared to a Dutch athlete, when I was leaving the sport at a, as a gold medalist, and there was a, a new guy named Sven Kramer coming into the sport as a 17 year old um, junior, he was making 900,000 guilders, which is about a million dollars a year, as he entered the sport, never won anything but a junior world championship. And I was the best in the world. And I was making 
but 600 bucks from U.S. speed skating a month during the season and $1,000 during the season from the U.S. Olympic Committee. And then my $24,000 that I was making from Home Depot. That's, that was my, the extent of my income was that. Um, so not a level playing field. So I knew that I couldn't control that. I knew that I, no one's going to come and sponsor a sport in the U.S. that you're never going to see on the TV in the four years leading up to the, the games. And during the games, you can't wear their sponsor because it's an unbranded event. It's just the difficulty of our sport in, in today's you know, sports machine. So um, I, I, had to, I had to do what I had to do. It was just part of my process. I would get up at six in the morning. We lived in Park City in a house that the uh, U.S. Speed Skating had rented for us for our top athletes. I get up at six, I leave the house at seven, drive down to the rink, get there by eight. I'd go up and stretch out from eight to nine and get on the ice at nine. I'd have our workouts from nine to 11. I get off, warm down, stretch, get to Home Depot by noon. You know, eat, slam it down a sandwich on the way to the to Home Depot right there on 4700 South, which is about five miles from the rink. Um, I'd work from noon to four, sometimes noon to five, depending on the day and how it went. I was in electrical, garden, floor and wall, and just on those hard concrete uh, floors all day long, and um, I you know I'd come back to the rink, eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something just to kind of perk me up with some kind of sugar and some energy. Get into my next workout again, warm up for an hour and stretch and do my workout. I get done about 9:30, get back to the house at 10:30, eat dinner and go to bed and do it again. Six six days a week, I don't know how many weeks a year, but that was just my routine. I needed I got about six hours of sleep a night, but that's all I needed. If I had six hours of sleep, I was great. If I had less than six, I was hurt the next day. But um, we had that finish line, that 2002 finish line we were trying to get to. And every day was, was focused on that. I was, you got to be almost a little crazy, I think, to have that mentality to just block everything out and focus on one thing your whole life. Everything is, it revolves around that moment. And I was trying to get everything to that moment to give myself the best opportunity. And if that meant working all summer long and all and part of the fall to, to be able to have the winter off and I wasn't going to do it and I was exhausted um but it, it I had no other choice but I wanted to give myself an opportunity I had to do that and I couldn't think about the Dutch guys that were just making millions and on tv commercials and getting free cars and bikes and whatever you know I, I had to had to pay for whatever I had we had we had very little support and we were just doing whatever we could to to try to realize those dreams that we had such an inspiring story because I feel like nowadays people find excuses on why they can't work out that day and they have probably more hours than you did and you found time to do your training schedule, go to work, come back to your training schedule again. You were just so regimented and I feel like that's so rare in the world today. Even in some athletes, I feel like everyone finds any excuse that they can to get away from it or you know i have to work out and i train so i don't want to get a job um and it's funny because me and sean actually both just got jobs at home depot two weeks ago yeah uh, <laughs> orange pride or whatever they call yeah, it yeah bleeding orange bleeding yes. orange yeah but it's yeah it, it can be a grind we worked 52 hours last week and we work out in the morning sometimes work out and skate we don't do it as long as you did but Man, it gets tough, and sometimes when you're working there, you just you, you don't want to do it anymore. It's just exhausting. But again, yeah, I'd be lying. I'd be lying if there were. I I didn't say there were days where I was just absolutely wrecked, and it was so hard to get motivated to go back to the rink or go get on a bike and ride two and a half or three hours. Um, my back was sore from being on those hard concrete floors, and um, but you know, I, again, I think, and you're probably you, my best advice to you is you, you got to. You got to find a way to, to, to make a routine. And if you stick the routine, it becomes tolerable and, and functional. Yeah. But if, you're, if your routine's all over the place, it's so hard to get a rhythm. And, and my body would wake up at six hours after sleep. I, my body would wake up and I would, okay, got to go. You know, I, and I get, to, I get to bed at night and boom, I was out because I was just exhausted. But I see skaters today, athletes today. I think it's just a product of our, product of our society. Um, you know, we want better for our kids, and sometimes we forget that it was those hard times that make us who we are. Uh, you know, we don't have the the uh, luxury of some of the stuff the kids have now. Uh, but I think it's not – I think you have to have that. Technology is great. Sports science is great. The new equipment is great, and having some support is great. But if you don't have that human factor of having to really want it and dig for it, 
um, I don't think you can be as great as, as you could be. It, it, it takes, one of the best pieces of advice I got was from Eric Hyden, who won five gold medals, 1980 Olympics, won every distance, set a, setting an Olympic record or a world record in every distance that he won. He was our team doctor going into the O2 games. And I remember saying, like, you know, what, you know, what went through your mind, you know, when you went to the line and I, you, you were do so dominant. He said, you know what? Every time I was going to an event, I told myself that I was willing to suffer more than anybody else out there. And if I got, I mean, everybody's going to be tired, but I was willing to suffer more than them. And I took that to heart. Like, you know what? I'm going to suffer. You know, when I was out there, I was working hard and I was training hard and jumping around with 40 pound weight vest on my back. I was, I was accepting. I was going to suffer. I don't care. I want to train harder than anybody else because I didn't want to have any excuses when it came down to it. Yeah, I'm 5'4". The guys are giants. I had to change my technique and get lower to get in their glide per stroke. I had to find out my physiology to see it worked for me. Um, but everybody has to do that. You, you can't, it's not a cookie cutter uh, program for everybody. And what you guys are doing now is admirable. If you're getting up and doing that and, and you inspire people around you, that's only going to make you better because you feel that inspiration. You're going to start getting people that follow you that want to come out and work out with you. And, and you just build from there. I mean, we are so connected as individuals. We just have to realize that and, and, you know, and, and help each other out. And it, it, you, we can rise together. Yeah. We've been training with the same program up in Monument, Colorado for, uh, I know I've been there for about 10 years now and, I can remember back being 14 years old, looking at the guys who were ahead of me and they were playing junior hockey. They were playing college hockey and being in the gym at the same time as them was so motivating and so driving. And now being on the flip side of that, uh, where I'm the older player and some of the guys are now looking up to us. It's that same thing, that same connection you're talking about. I want to show them that you need to work as hard as you can to make it. So I, I can't slack when I was young because the older guys was where I wanted to be. And now I can't slack that I'm old because you want to lead the way for the younger guys. So I, that's a great point you make there. Um, and, and we may fail, you know, I, you, you never know. But I mean, I could have went to the games, went through a turn, fell, fallen, and it was done. Right. You, you never know what could happen. But I didn't, when I went to the line, I, I was confident that I knew I had done everything I could for that opportunity there. And I just had to execute. and if I would have slacked or threw away some workouts or just playing, you know, took it easy at time, I, I wouldn't, I don't think I would have had that confidence. And I don't know if I would have been absolutely 100% ready mentally because everybody talks about this. So the top five guys could win anybody. It's the one who's mentally prepared in that day that have success that can, that can, you know, push away the adversity. I mean, I remember um, my tongue came out of my, my, my skate. I, I got off my on ice warm up an hour before my race, and I had a Eric Hyden, my our doctor was was actually suturing it back in just ten minutes before I got my skates and went upstairs to race. Um, on a normal day, I probably would have been packed, going, "Oh my gosh, you know my tongue's out of my skate. What am I going to do?" And remember, a bolt, I was tightening my skate and my bolt stripped, so I had to take the bolt out, put a new bolt in, which means taking my skate apart, putting a bolt in my front in my blade frame putting it back up, lying it up and everything. This is all happening in that hour I'm supposed to be resting before I go up uh, to race. And again, any other time in, the, in, the, in my career, I probably would have been panicked. But for that, some reason that day, I was pretty calm saying, oh, anybody got a bolt? You know, and I put the bolt in, like, okay. And then you know, my, to my tongue's out. That's Eric, anybody have a thread needle? Eric's, I got sutures. They sutured it, put it back on the, on the ground, rested for about 15 minutes, and then went upstairs and, and started my warm up and went to the race. So I, I was very at peace at that time because I knew that I, I couldn't have done anything more for that moment. And all I had to do was go out there and hopefully execute and hope my best was the best of the day um, or even my, even my best. If I, if I went out there and would have got eighth and had my best race, I couldn't complain. Um, I would have fallen, yeah, I would have been disappointed. But I knew that – I knew that, that – uh, that disappointment of 98 where I didn't get to skate. But if I would have skated back then, my only goal was to, to walk in behind the country's, my country flag and compete. I would have wrapped it up and went on in my life. But because I didn't get to skate, for whatever reason, that clerical error, it brought me back four more years to now have this opportunity. I was so excited to race. You might, if you watch the video, I was going to the line, kind of jumping like this, just saying to myself, just believe it. Just believe it. Because I was so excited. I was finally going to be able to race at the Olympics and this distance that I was, which was my distance, I felt. 
and nobody could stop me. It wasn't a clerical error or anything. You know, barring an earthquake or something, another disaster, I was going to go to that line and skate. And, and I was just so excited to get off that line and race. I love that. I don't know when it was instilled in me because I don't know if you remember when I was younger, I was kind of a fat, chubby little kid. <laughs> but now throughout the year and even in the summer, if I, you know, if I get tired or if I think about skipping a rep or doing less weight, it eats, it, it eats away at me. And I feel like if I don't do everything that I possibly could have throughout the week, when I get to a game, if I play bad in the game or I give up a bad goal, I just attest it back to, you know, skipping a rep or doing less weight than I probably could have and not pushing myself to be better. And I feel like that's what makes people successful is that constant need for, you know, self-improvement. And then also it gives you so much confidence that confidence that when you're in the moment, as you said, you have no doubts about anything and you just let your body do what it does. And you're so mentally free and you don't have any worries. And if you do fail or you don't succeed how you want to, you can live with knowing that you did everything in your possible power to be the best that you could on that particular day. And he said it right on. Confidence is the hardest thing to gain and the easiest thing to lose. You could be stopping everything, right? Yeah. And then you miss one going like, oh man, what am I doing? What did I do? Am I not standing right? Are my blades not sharp? Is my glove on wrong? Did I eat the right, the right breakfast? I mean, it's so crazy what our minds do. But yeah. if we, if we, spend as much time in our minds as we do our bodies and, and, and really teach that self-talk and, and being, again, you don't want to pat yourself in the back all the time, but there's a process for everything we do. And if we can continue to stay on process, that's where we have success, you know, it, because it's, it's methodical. We, we've done it. We're, we're, we're our bodies used to it. Our minds used to it. It's a routine. And you have more success that way. I think. Agreed. So you've talked about focusing on what you can control but there was another large obstacle that was out of your hands. You're listed at five foot four, significantly <laughs> shorter than the average speed skater. Shawnee Davis, who eventually broke one of your records, is actually almost a full foot taller than you at six foot two. How did you compensate with this size disparity? You know, I, I've never known anything different. Uh, I've been small my whole life. I've been the smallest guy in my class growing up. I think the only time I wasn't the smallest guy in my class was for a very short time between seventh and eighth grade where I came back after the summer and I was a half an inch taller than one of the guys. And then he, in that year he grew, grew up and I was the smallest guy again. <laughs> um, you know, I'm just, it is what it is. I remember a story when I was, when I was young, my dad took me to a pop Warner football tryout and I got there a day late and um, I walked up and the, my dad said, Hey, can my son still try out? And the guy said, no, he's too small. And my dad didn't really stand up for me or anything. And he says, are you sure? He's like, no, it's too small. And he, he goes, I don't know. And he brings it over his big 14 year old, you know, maturation giant. This guy who's, you know, he's got a beard pretty much at 14 years old. This is linebacker. And he goes, can you tackle him? And I looked at him. I said, I'll try. But the guy's no, no, you can't play. And he, and he sent me home. I couldn't play football. Um, that was my first year ever trying out football. So I was always a small guy. Um, I just, I don't know. I always just tried, I guess it was in a, in a way a blessing. I always worked harder to keep up with those bigger guys. And, and then I thought at times if we're climbing mountains on bikes, they got more weight to push, you know, but if, if we're going downhill, I've got to chase them because they have more weight to take them down the hill. Um, you know, I was a little bit good at accelerating pretty quick because I had short limbs, but in speed skating, you want to have long rhythmic pushes. So that was a little bit of a disadvantage, especially outdoors because I was light and getting blown around with the wind. Um, <laughs> You know, in inline skating, uh, I just I was able to squeeze in tight spots because it's more of a dynamic sport, like short track speed skating is. I was actually built like a short tracker, but when I started ice speed skating, there was no short track team in Milwaukee. I, I went to long track. So I, I I mean I don't know I mean I don't I don't know if anybody out there is small or tall or whatever, but you know we we're given this body and the talents we have and the mental capacity, uh, the, the the physiology, and we just got to try to make make it work um as best we can that might for me it might have been i was uh a national level a club level or an olympic level I, I i didn't know but i spent 18 years finding out of what what i could do and every time i got a little bit better and learned a little bit more a little bit stronger 
I, I got more confidence and just had more doors kind of opened up or I had to push more doors, more doors were there for me to push down. I love that uh, you continually come back and not verbatim, but control what you can control. And that's really, I feel like what you did throughout your entire life. And that's one thing that I think I try to live by is just control the things that we can control. And a lot of times it's hard because there's certain things that happen in your life and you kind of want to do the poor me or why is this happening to me type of thing. But I love that throughout your whole entire career. And I'm sure even now it's just do what you can to, you know, better yourself in your life. That's all I can do, you know? And I mean, if you look, you take drugs into the equation, there's a lot of drugs in sports and I know that there wasn't enough money in, in American speed skating because most of the countries that are rich in speed skating have the opportunity to have support teams of doctors and scientists and things like that. So there's a lot of teams like the Russian scandal and there's been stories all over the world of, of athletes taking drugs for sports enhancement. Um, and, but I could never think about that. I could never think, Oh, what is he taking or what is he taking? Because it didn't matter. Yeah. I, I couldn't control it. I had to hopefully leave it up to the, you know, to the, the powers that beat it to, to test that person and find out that they were cheating. And all I could do was skate my races. Yeah. I mean, so we've too talked much, about, go on, you know, too much to think about all that stuff happens. You just got to, you know, kind of be, you know, narrow minded or I should say narrow focused and try to beat your best at what you can and those opportunities you can be. Uh, but there's a lot of distractions out there, especially today. It's, it's tough being a kid. Um, I, have a, I have an 18 year old daughter and there's all kinds of different influences going around and um, you just hope that you, and I might talk to her. My biggest thing with her, with her is that even in this COVID situation, she's talking about, Oh, uh, class of 2020 is cursed. You know, we were born around September 11th and now this, and we can't graduate. And I said, you know, honey, you're, you're dealing with, 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 with millions of students are dealing with, you, know, you, you can't control this. It's like, I, I just, we, I just got married Friday at a very small ceremony in a, at a, a park trail off the side of a trail with a very smooth group of people because you couldn't have a wedding during this time. You just got to control what you can. And for us, we, my, my wife and I, we decided it's, it's important to, to have this done now on this date, a date we wanted. And we can have a celebrate later when this is all over. But what can we do now to fulfill our dreams to get married? And that was have a ceremony, very small. You know, our, our, the guy who married us, our judge, had a mask on and you could barely hear him. But, you know, that's, that's what we had to do. And I told my daughters, we got to deal with what we what, – what, uh, variables are out there and make the best that we can solve the solve that make a solution solve the equation as best you can for now because it will change you have to adapt again adapt and change congratulations on the wedding by the way thanks so you're always striving to better yourself um, and setting new goals how difficult was it for you when you finally had to retire from the sport well it was it was tough uh, and I kind of I kind of went out on my, not really on my own terms. It was a little tough. Uh, this is where life really got hard for me. Um, I got divorced on the way to my, to the games in, the, in 2006. And um, let's just say her, her plans were different than my plans. And so I came home uh, from a, a World Cup season and uh, was shocked and uh my life changed and this was right before this is the this is the year going into the game so the whole year of the games I, I lost you know 10 pounds um I couldn't sleep uh I was being prescribed Ambien to try to take the you know to be able to go to bed because I I was fine when I was doing things but once I got home at night and um my you know my mind uh got quiet I thought about what was happening in my life and my daughter was four years old at the time I wasn't able to see her through all this it was it was just really a hard time for me. Um, couldn't control anything and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And, um, but I, but again, I went back to, well, you know, what? I don't think I'm going to do well at this games. I was, excuse me. I was actually skating really well before this all happened, but I had a teammate, Chad Hedrick, who was primed to win. And so my focus became being his best teammate so that I could, I didn't want to leave him hanging. It was only two of us that could push each other on the, on the ice. And if I left, he'd had nobody to train with going to the games. And again, he was ready. He was ready to win. We were, I was kind of a skater coach, also uh, a teammate and helping him learn the sport more because he came from inline skating as well and followed in my first footsteps. 
Um, so then I just tried to work with him and he went there to Torino and won gold, silver, and bronze. I was able to witness that. Um, you know, I, I shared the experience with him and then I came home and, and I was done. I just had nothing in me left. I had, I had no fight in me. I was still going through a divorce. It was, it was, it is the most painful thing I've ever been through in my life. Um, cause you, you can't control the other person's doing it and it involves your mind, your, in your, your heart. And, um, you know, I just didn't know what to do. And so I, when I retired from skating, uh, I was ready to kind of just move on to Home Depot. I got a new management program. And then Chad and my friend, Catherine Rainey, my two best friends, they said, hey, they were my teammates. They said, hey, can you come back and uh, take some video of us or give us some training tips? We don't have a coach. They didn't have a coach either for a few months. So I would go to work and I'd come back and I'd, I'd watch them or I'd coach them a little bit, write some training programs. And I got into coaching. And then next thing you know, I'm, I'm a development coach. And that steered my direction of my my um my passion for skating into developing the next group and i had i gotten some support from us the u.s olympic committee to bring in 10 athletes from usa roller sports who were kind of in my position when i left the sport a world team member had some won some medals at a world championship and i basically put them in a two-year program to help them transition from inline to ice and and taught them everything that i knew that i discovered or i had, i had figured out over the last six years and out of those 10 athletes I think eight of them made national teams and then two of them on the Olympic team. I ended up being the Olympic team coach in Vancouver. So that, that became my coaching route for a number of years. And then when I came back from uh, Vancouver, the foundation hired me. And so we want to bring you in to help attract more youth and diversity. And so I became a youth outreach director. So I was very fortunate that you had a really bad experience and an exit from the sport. I was able to find something positive and that came from people around me who just put another pathway in front of me that I chose to take and that steered my life to where I'm at today. Like you said, you're now the director of sports at the Utah Olympic Oval. From your experience, what advice do you give to the younger generation of speed skaters and athletes in general? Well, for the kids, it's, it's, it's half fun, you know, um, develop your skills, be multi-sport, um, you know, prac don't get into that spontaneous that spontaneous play that I did as a kid. You learn about yourself. Uh, play games as a coach. I remember used to play games with the younger kids, like we played frisbee or dodgeball and other sports that weren't skating, to see how they react from being like the best skater to the worst dodgeball player or so on, and how how they how their minds can either cut it cut it off and say I'm done, I don't want to play anymore, this sucks, or I'm going to be a better dodgeball player. How can I throw the Frisbee better for ultimate Frisbee? Okay. Or how can I be a better, you know, this or that. Um, so the kids, it's play. Learn about yourself. Develop your skills. Because what you're doing now may not be what you're doing in 10 years. It, it may or may not be. But I went through different sports. A lot of what I learned in different sports helped me in my career. Um, for, the, for the ones that are already have chosen that path, it's attention to detail. It's be a student of your sport. You know, try to figure out what makes you tick. Learn your physiology, learn your rhythm patterns, your, your training cycles. A lot of people don't know that their bodies operate in cycles. And, and for me, it was, I went about two weeks altitude, about two weeks, I was pretty tired. And I'd have a third week where I kind of modified the training so that I could recover. But I didn't need a lot, I needed a lot of time to recover. I needed about three days to recover and I could train hard again. Uh, in Milwaukee, it was four weeks because there's lower altitude. But some people, you know, need a week and a half and then they're, done we need to recover a little bit but if you find out your cycle i think it helps you train better smarter and you have those those uh that climb a little bit faster your curves a little bit sharper going up so for those those ones in the middle yeah find out about who you are physiologically mentally um and at, as an older age athlete on the way out um it's really about like what drives you what continues to drive you um for me when I'm, as i was older it was a it was a goal of getting Olympics. It was the goal of, of 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 execution at that time. I had people around me, and I I saw my my goal, and I kept chasing it. Um, I I learned I did all those steps. I had fun. I learned about myself, and then now I was trying to apply that and to to keep it going. Just you know, one more games or whatever it might have been. Um, but use that experience, use that confidence that you've gained, and don't sell yourself short. Um, you learn a lot growing up, and you learn a lot more from failure than you do at and the successes i had won really about three or four times at a high level on on ice the rest of the times i was down on the bottom and up, you know up and down seventh fifth twelfth 
but I, you know, I want a, a World Cup. Uh, I want a B Group World Cup, and I want the Olympics. Um, but it wasn't always, uh, you know, up there at the top, just you know, dangling medals around my chest or anything like that. Uh, I was just just learning. So don't be afraid to learn. Derek, we can't thank you enough for coming on. Such an unbelievable and uh, motivating story that no matter what circumstances are thrown your way, that if you set a goal, you can't accomplish it. Um, such an amazing story from you and so inspiring. I've known a little bit about it, but hearing it from you personally has been so eye-opening um, towards me and my goals. And I'm sure Sean can attest to that too. But we're so happy that uh, you were able to have some time out of your busy schedule to, to come on and share your story with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, I hope that uh, whoever's listening, I can reach the one person if they're having some doubts. I was just like you years ago and I had people that inspired me. And so again, don't, don't, uh, don't be afraid or I shouldn't say be afraid, but don't be afraid to recognize who's around you in your circle, who can, who can help you and you can help them. It's, I have a saying that's called rise. It's a relationship inferred self-efficacy which really means if you, if I got your back and you got mine, and we have the same goals going forward, we will have a better rate of success and rise together. And so many times in my life that has happened from the time I was 14 and skated to the Olympics. I had people around me that I could, you know, um, get, I could work with every day and help. They'd build me up when I couldn't, when I was ready to crack, they were there for me. When they were ready to crack, I was there to help push them. So take you guys, use each other. And, and be your best. And again, you, you'll grab, people will gravitate towards you and that winning spirit and that passion you have. It's so important to have that in whatever it is we do. And so if you're out there listening, uh, yeah, don't be afraid of who you are and what you can learn and don't be afraid to change anything uh, and try anything. Uh, we will, you'll never know until you try it. Um, and just keep believing that you, you will succeed and uh, you will have fun doing it.